Ilya Rostovsky and I'm a second year engineering student at the University of British Columbia's Okanagan campus. In my first year of engineering, I was required to take a course called Applied Sciences 171 Engineering Drawing CAD CAM Design. Within this course, we required to make something on SolidWorks 3D CAD software. Being interested in space since a little kid and one day aspiring to become an astronaut, I led a team of five students to build a model of the International Space Station, which I will show you in just a sec. If I may say for now, I see great potential for commercial and private space companies such as Orbital ATK, Boeing, and especially SpaceX. As we know, in 2012, SpaceX made history with their Dragon spacecraft becoming the first commercial spacecraft to deliver cargo to the International Space Station and then safely return cargo back to Earth. I see great success in this company's future and would be eager to work there on my way to becoming an astronaut. Anyways, without further ado, here is the International Space Station. The station is actually in its reverse orientation here. If you follow my cursor to the starboard side of the station, you can see the S56 truss segment. Attached to this is a photovoltaic array, and there's four photovoltaic arrays on the starboard side, as well as four on the port side. If you look on the port side of the station, you can see the P56 truss segments, and then moving back to the starboard, we can see the S34 truss segments, and back to the port, the P34 truss segments. As I previously mentioned, there are eight main photovoltaic arrays on the International Space Station. They are used to power the various activities and experiments inside the station. Now, what we have done to maximize the electricity generated from these photovoltaic arrays is make them rotate. So as you can see here, just click, drag, and rotate each of the photovoltaic arrays. All eight main ones that we have put on the station do rotate, which simulates tracking the sun. Now looking aft from the forward position, we can see we have the most visible parts of the early external active thermal control system, the radiators. Each of these radiators is deployable and retractable, as would be on the real International Space Station, and within you'll have your various cooling loops running ammonia. If we now orientate ourselves in a zenith location looking nadir, we see we have some pumps on the external surface of the trusses. Uh, we have actually stamps, NASA, um, and ISS into them. And you can imagine these would help pump the ammonia for the radiators which I've just shown. Moving in the port direction along the station, we can locate the S1 and Z1 truss segments. On these segments on the actual space station, there is another set of early external active thermal control systems. However, due to time constraints, we could not add them here. Now, if we locate the S0 truss segment in the center of the station, we can see that directly in front of it is a pressure mating adapter, which, as you can see here, is attached to RASVET, which is formally known as the docking cargo module. Now looking in the nadir direction, you can see we've added photovoltaic arrays to the RASVET module, as well as we have docked the famous Russian Soyuz spacecraft to the nadir location of the RASVET module. Moving aft from the S0 truss segment, we can locate the Russian modules Zarya and Zvezda, to which we have attached an automated transfer vehicle. Further in the nadir direction is the NACA multipurpose laboratory module. Attached to this are two research modules and the famous Russian Soyuz spacecraft. Moving to a more zenith location on the space station, we can see we've added some additional parts, such as a science power platform, which contains more photovoltaic arrays. If we look a little closer, we can locate two astronauts on the zenith location of the science power platform, in addition to the photovoltaic array attached to the P6 truss. Moving forward from pressure mating adapter 1, we can locate the Unity module or node 1. Attached to this is the Z1 truss segment and the Quest joint airlock. Upon closer look at the extravehicular hatch, you can notice we've made use of a simple gear and pulley system. By turning the wheel, I can extend the pillars, thus locking the door. Making use of a simple hinge, I can open and close the extravehicular hatch to the airlock. If we examine the airlock as a whole from a section view, You'll notice we have three zenith storage compartments and one nadir storage compartment. If you now focus your attention to the equipment lock, 
You'll see I've included storage space to store possibly extravehicular mobility units or EMUs, Russian Orland spacesuits, or perhaps other spacewalk hardware. To separate the equipment lock from the crew lock, I've designed my own intravehicular hatch. Once astronauts enter the crew lock, they can close the intravehicular hatch, depressurize, and exit through the extravehicular hatch. Upon completing the spacewalk, astronauts can enter and close the extravehicular hatch, repressurize, and then open the intravehicular hatch. Moving forward from the Quest Joint airlock, we can locate the United States Destiny Laboratory. Housed on the external surface of this module are two external storage platforms, ESP-1 and ESP-2, both of which hold orbital replacement units. Due to project requirements, we have added two added modules and an extra pressure mating adapter. However, in the nadir direction of the second module, we have added the Columbus European Laboratory, and then aft of this is the cupola. Zooming in on the cupola, you will notice its seven windows and shutters. The cupola is used to conduct experiments, dockings, and observations of Earth. You may also notice we have added external handles for spacewalkers. Such handles can also be found on many different modules of our space station. Continuing forward, we can locate the Harmony module, or Node 2. Further forward from this is Pressure Mating Adapter 2. Again, due to project requirements, we added two additional modules in the Zenith and Nader locations of Node 2. Moving in the port direction, we can locate the Kibu module, or the Japanese Experimental module. In the Zenith location of this pressurized module, we can locate the Experiment Logistics module. Further in the port direction lies the remote manipulator system and exposed facility. Experimental payloads are fully exposed to the space environment on the exposed facility. These experimental payloads can be monitored using the two cameras we have implemented on the robotic arm of the remote manipulator system. Now for my favorite part of this project, the mobile surfacing system. This consists of CanadaArm2, a mobile base, and Dexter. As you can see, we have made the mobile base move along the various truss segments of the station. This allows the mobile surfacing system to catch future spacecraft and orientate modules as needed. Now if you look closer, you will see myself in an extravehicular mobility unit controlling Dexter. Due to project requirements and to be easily understood by our classmates, we did modify Dexter, which I will show you soon. However, please notice that the mobile surfacing system is free to move in all directions along the station. You may also notice that we have added some wiring from the mobile base system to Canadarm2. We can now further inspect Canadarm2. It is 17 meters long, and since it was installed in 2001, it has been used to assemble the station, move supplies, equipment, and even astronauts around. Canadarm2 can also be used to capture free flying spacecraft. This was utilized in 2012 when it captured SpaceX's Dragon Craft, making it the first commercial spacecraft in history to deliver cargo to the ISS. You'll notice I've attached two pin joints to the base of Canadarm2, allowing it to freely rotate. Now again, due to project requirements, I made Canadarm2 into eight concentric cylinders that fold within each other. Further, I stamped the Canadian logo onto many of these segments. Moving on to Dexter, this two-armed robotic handyman is used for routine maintenance, such as changing batteries. This reduces the need for astronauts to perform risky spacewalks and frees up their time. Now we have made some modifications to Dexter for this project. You will notice that I am externally controlling Dexter and free to rotate in many directions. Upon zooming in on each of the ligatures of Dexter, you will notice each of them are free to rotate in the designated direction, giving the user complete control. You may also notice that each of Dexter's arms are able to move up and down and rotate along its base. The base itself also consists of two unique joints, giving Dexter complete maneuverability. As I previously mentioned, we did change the design of Dexter to be easily understood by our classmates as well as for project requirements. I have added claw-like extremities to Dexter and made it each talon so that it mirrors the motion of its opposite talon. The talons then attach the base of their claw using ball and socket joints. This concludes the SOLIDWORKS 3D CAD software project in which we have built a model of the International Space Station. I hope you enjoyed this video and share my aspiration in one day reaching this feat of human innovation.